Okay, so now we're going to look at some innovations in healthcare technology. Uh, we're really uh, focused on uh, some of the uses of technology, not so much a clinical type of system, but uh, where healthcare technology has kind of advanced in terms of being able to disseminate information or be mobile or, uh, you know, use the uh, decision support systems. So let's take a look at where we, where we are. So while arguably EHR and PHR systems are really the most important innovations with regards to the transmission of medical information technology between providers and patients and creating that holistic synergistic view, um, innovations in healthcare continue to change the industry. Now we have advances in decision support systems, and we'll talk about that, where why computer systems are able to aid doctors and nurses in terms of clinical treatment and diagnosis. Advances in telemedicine, which basically allow uh, patients to remain in their own home uh, and get uh, some treatment and diagnoses uh, from providers or nurses remotely. Uh, we have uses of cloud computing uh, for hospitals, payers as well, and mobile technologies, which are going to be used by payers and, and providers to some extent. So a clinical decision support system basically is an active knowledge system which uses two or more items of patient data to generate case-specific advice. What we're doing is we're taking a longitudinal history, we're going to take some set of uh, current symptoms, plug them into the system and see what uh, the decision support system recommends as being the potential diagnosis and then provide some uh, information on treatment. Uh, it basically is a decision support system that contains a significant amount of patient data as well as aggregated data from other areas. Uh, you'll see these decision support systems as uh, connected to evidence-based medicine, whereby statistics are gathered based on various evidence of uh, clinical trials and certain incidences, and basically we aggregate all this information together. And we'll see something like that when we talk about the IBM Watson system on the next slide. But the advances in decision support systems are really the fact that the early DSS ones were targeted towards medical practices. They really neglected some of the nursing type support and that really hasn't changed that much. Um, and early on we didn't have advanced analytics, but that has since changed. Now the best example of a clinical decision support system is IBM Watson. Uh, this is the computer that won on Jeopardy and ultimately it was purchased by Sloan Kettering and actually it was also purchased by a payer, WellPoint, uh, to actually uh, provide uh, support for decisions. But the one at Sloan Kettering is the most interesting because as of 2013 it had basically passed medical school and it passed its residency in oncology and I believe it took a total of 13 or 14 months for that to occur. Watson technically is only going to be used as a supporting tool for oncologists. But the way Watson works is they feed into Watson a series of journal articles and every bit of both structured and unstructured data that they can so that Watson has this large database. And what ultimately happens is, is that Watson has these powerful algorithms and powerful processing that can weed through all of those items to determine what the probability of uh, diagnoses for a particular set of symptoms are and then prescribe treatments. On the blackboard you'll see there are a couple of videos for Watson and I encourage you to go through them because it is an absolutely fascinating piece of technology and a fascinating look into the future of decision support systems. One of the principal problems that for this is that if you talk to anybody, you say, would you be willing to be treated by a computer? In other words, provide your symptoms into a computer and have the computer determine what is actually wrong with you and then prescribe a treatment. And there gets the whole problem of whether or not a computer could actually replace a human being in terms of those types of uh, pieces of information. It's a very interesting debate and one that I will encourage on the discussion board. Telemedicine increases the communication between patients and clinicians. Clinicians can receive the data in the forms of vital signs and other types of uh, clinical systems. So for example, you might have a blood pressure machine at home for an elderly patient and where he, can, he or she can take their blood pressure. And then via wireless network, it can send the information to the doctor so they can monitor blood pressure uh, constantly every day. This is also very useful for diabetics and asthmatics as well. So other types of telemedicine include visits by nurses that can send information to doctors and providers remotely using some mobile devices. Long-term medical care players, basically what these, um, what these things, uh, what these provi providers do is they help patients with long-term uh, problems uh, and they will send nurses or they will manage 
the, the elderly or people who have uh, some disease or ailment that is of significantly long period of time. Most of the insurance companies would prefer that the people remain home as opposed to being in the hospital because generally it is cheaper. It is also probably safer. One of the running jokes is if you're sick, the last place you want to go is a hospital because you can get an additional infection or um, you just won't recover as quickly as you do at home. Uh, this is one of the principles behind this. Also for telemedicine and diabetic information, asthmatic information, uh, those types of cessation programs are all uh, very open and, and very, um, they can utilize the telemedicine type of technology very, uh, very well. Cloud computing provides services over the internet. Now the purpose of the cloud is that the services are dynamic in nature and they are more scalable based on user needs. So the types of services include infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, and storage as a service. Now what this means is, is that, in, especially in healthcare, we can take our data center operation and we can basically outsource it to a third party where they will basically manage the total number of servers that we need, they will manage storage, they can manage basically the entire set of uh, infrastructure for us. And as we need more power or more processing power or more storage, uh, we are able to contact them and they will dynamically allocate additional storage, servers, processing power, and even network bandwidth utilization. In terms of software as a service, we might have something like an EHR in the cloud. So you can take a look at Athena Health and Practice Fusion, whereby the providers do not have to actually install anything on local machines or maintain servers and require uh, information technology support. They just need to maintain their network connectivity to the cloud and then all of the information is stored in the cloud. Now there are some concerns with regards to security, there are concerns with regards to you know contractual obligations and loss of control for the provider but when you think about it providers aren't necessarily in the business of being information technologists so they would either have to hire someone anyway to do this or they can basically outsource it. So there's always an argument pro and against whether or not putting your EHR in the cloud is actually um, a good idea. Personally, I happen to think it is a good idea, uh, but it does need some controls and you need to make sure that you're working with reputable companies. Additional types of uh, service related cloud computing is storage, uh, whereby we can actually have off-site storage for medical imaging or audio files or even other text files uh, depending on the needs of the organization. Uh, storage is fairly expensive, but when you, uh, it's actually much cheaper now than it once was, but when you aggregate it and when you have economies of scale in a data center, uh, the costs come down significantly. Now, mobile technologies represent a very, very big opportunity. The tablet designs are more ergon uh, ergonomically appealing, and basically we can add on devices to EHRs both within a hospital and outside a provider's facility. The wireless networks and cellular networks are becoming much more reliable, or they are really reliable right now, but they're becoming even more reliable. And so getting that information on a regular basis from tablets or from heart monitors or from blood pressure machines uh, make the collection of data much easier and make it more reliable, and you can guarantee the integrity of the data that's coming across. Even smaller devices such as pacemakers and glucose monitors can send information more frequently for analysis to doctors and even into the PHR systems so that the patients can manage their care more effectively. You'll even see things like scales uh, where you might uh, test your weight on a daily basis that are wirelessly connected to your home network and then that information is transmitted to your PHR, uh, say Microsoft Health Vault. So the integration of wireless and mobile devices to decision support systems really helps support management of chronic conditions and overall health.